in three, two. All right, good afternoon. I now call to order the October 19th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee, at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion of an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Regino if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Regino, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Sure. Mr. Kuhn? Here. Ms. Hen? Here. Ms. Causey? Here. Mr. McMillian? Here. Mr. Offerman? Here. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Regino, can you please call the roll? of staff members participating in today's meeting. Yes. Mr. Hartlove? Here. Mr. Tantliff? Present. Ms. Murphy? Here. Ms. Boswell McComas? Here. Mr. Holmes? Here. Ms. Myers? Here. And Ms. Lembo Wistad? Here. Okay, and if there are any additional staff participating that were not mentioned, can you please state your name? Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So before we start with the agenda, I just want to thank everybody um, for taking over last during the last meeting when I had to exit uh, and and continuing the meeting without my presence. I appreciate it. I appreciate all the hard work that goes into preparing for this, uh, and I'm just I'm sorry I, I didn't have uh, the ability to stay for the entire meeting. But I just want to thank everyone uh, for sticking it out, and making it happening. All right, so we're, uh, we're going to start first. Um, our first item of new business is called non-public placement. Ms. Myers, uh, can you please review the non-public placement information that's been provided? Sure, I'll, I'll grab the PowerPoint and then uh, Ms. Myers will speak. Thank you. Can everyone see it? Yes. You can. All right. You may proceed, Allison. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to meet everyone. This is my first opportunity to do this, so um, thank you for having me. So um, we're going to go over the non-public school referral process this afternoon. So next slide, please. So as part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, um, we are required to provide both. Um, wait, it's not on the next slide. There we go. Thank you. OK, so as part of IDEA, we are required to provide um, placement um, and discuss LRE for all of our students with an IEP as part of that process. Um, the, the placement in LRE is that least restrictive environment for students, so Least restrictive environment can range from LRE A, which you see on the left side of the screen, um, through a bunch of alphabet um, to where we land today with the private separate day school. Just a little bit about LRE. Um, it is that 
um, process of determining both placement location as well as the amount of time that students have access to general education. So what this chart shows on LREA, you see that's 80% or more of a, of a student's day is within side general education. Um, that's typically what we would talk about full inclusion, might be delivered through a co-teaching model, uh, maybe delivered through small group instruction. Then as you go up, you can see LREB is really that mix that inside of general education for 40 to 79%. So a portion of their day is outside of gen ed and a portion of their day is inside of gen ed. Um, LREC on here, as you can see, is listed twice actually um, for purposes of really being able to um, explain that LREC is they are inside of general education less than 40% of their day. So the majority of the day um, is with other students with special receiving special education services um, in a small group. That also might be students who are accessing a regional program. So um, outside of their homeschool model at times, um, but really the same LRE, but just placed out of homeschool. And that also is outlined. So then you go up to public separate day schools. We have four of those in Baltimore County, Maiden Choice, Ridge Ruxton, Battle Monument, and White Oak School, which I'm sure you're familiar with all four of those. Um, and that's really for our students who have those most significant cognitive medical and or need for behavioral supports. All of those services are provided outside of general education. There are no students um, in that building who don't have an IEP. So every student has an IEP in that in those settings. Then private separate day is also known as non-public. That's LREG. Um, and really that those services are for students um, that have the most intensive needs, um, whether cognitive, um, learning needs, um, medical potential, or behavioral supports. So within Baltimore County, we're able to provide um, a large majority of services for students with receiving special education um, instruction. However, we do have a a chunk um, who do need um, and qualify for that private separate day school setting. Next slide, please. So the IEP team process is at the um, base of any IEP team decision, obviously, and any recommendation for non-public. Um, most recommendations for non-public come out of this IEP team process. So that just a review of that process for everyone is that you start with that identification of needs for our students. Um, there's a formal evaluation process that occurs. Um, you must determine eligibility. So if a student is identified um, as having a um, educational disability, um, then they could be they deemed eligible for an IEP. They write an initial IEP. We implement it. We monitor progress on that IEP and that re IEP is reviewed annually, if not more than that. And then that process continues to re we reevaluate and you come back through that process. Um, as part of that IEP team process is where um, the decision again about least restrictive environment, LRE and placement is determined. And if the team determines that a non-public setting or private separate day school is the student's least restrictive environment, then that decision is made. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this just outlines what how that process, how that process looks, how we land with a team referral to a non-public school. So if the team develops that IEP and determines least restrictive environment or that LRE to be a non-public school or private separate day, then the team um, they, they determine that, they make that recommendation. Referrals are actually made um, by the school team. Um, well, not the school team, but the referral from the Department of Special Education then goes to appropriate public sep to private separate day schools. So um, it may be that we have our private separate day schools, our non-public schools. Um, we have a variety of schools that are used um, by our school system um, for a variety of needs. Schools are specialized um, in order to meet the needs of their students. Um, I can stop for a question. I saw. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Mr. Offerman. Please, please ask your question. Okay. If you're talking, you're on mute. Mike off. I'm sorry. Uh, when I was uh, the guidance chair and a counselor at Tesson High School, I remember, and perhaps I, this is not correct, uh, <clears throat> going to some IEPs for students who had uh, residential. Uh, programs both mm -hmm. in and out of state. Is that was am I am I uh, am I correct about that? And does that still happen? 
Yep, you are correct about that. So we do have students that actually is the next kind of LRE in that continuum is um, for private separate day. There are students who need to access a residential setting. Um, now, our students access residential settings sometimes for educational purposes included and sometimes for mental health needs, but have a, maybe a general education IEP. So there are students that we do co-fund with other agencies in order to support in the residential setting, but there is a small group of students who we actually are responsible for funding both the residential school setting, um, their schooling and and the, the living purposes of that for residential. So yes, you're correct. Thank you. No problem. I saw another question. Ms. Ann, if you have a question, go ahead. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Thank you, Ms. Myers. Um, if we could go back to the slide that showed the continuum of LRE. Thank you. Yes, that one. Um, I would appreciate some clarification around the home and hospital placement as to why that's placed where it is on this continuum, because it's it's my understanding that if we can't meet a student's needs in one of these other placements, that home and hospital has almost been used as a, I don't want to say last resort, but it doesn't seem to quite fit this linear continuum as it's pictured here. Could you speak to that? And is my understanding correct? And does it depend really on the student's needs as to the definition of least restrictive based on that individual? Yeah, so great question. So they're in alphabetical order here is how that is, um, but it is and home and hospital placement is um, it's not an interim placement, so we wouldn't be in home and hospital while we're waiting for a placement in a private separate day school, public separate day, even a gen ed environment. Home and hospital placement is because a student is, um, you know, unable to access a school setting due to medical condition or a medical circumstance that's going on. So that's really um, or they're in a hospital. So that's really where that falls. Um, and and I would so I, I, you're correct in indicating that none of these other LREs would be appropriate at that time if they're on home and hospital because it's determined that their health is at risk to where they need to be on home and hospital and aren't able to access a school setting at that time. When they're able to transition off of home and hospital, we have um, a tra you know, a plan that's put in place in order to transition that student back into a learning setting. But during that time, it's really at a place where they would either need to be in the hospital or their health is um, there's a statement indicating that the this condition is enough that they are not able to access instruction in a um, school schoolhouse of sorts at that time. Did that answer your question? It helps. So I have a follow up question then because okay. it seems as if we are and, and I can only speak anecdotally to this, but for students whose needs cannot be met in a school setting, public or private, I have heard that we are using the home and hospital placement as a catch-all to students whose needs cannot be met by the system. And as if that is, again, a, a catch-all because we can't meet for whatever needs, if if they are health needs, if, if we just have no other option and the needs cannot be met in a general education setting. Or for whatever reason, that student might be eligible, but they are, for whatever reason, not placed in, they don't get a private placement, they don't get a public separate day school placement. And, and I understand this is quite the lengthy process. So while someone, a student is going through this, if they're waiting for this placement and it's unsafe for them to be in a general education environment, where are they and is, is that accurate to say that a home and hospital placement? I, I heard you say that we're we're not using it as a temporary placement, but if that's the case, what do we? How do we meet the needs of these students who have serious concerns while they are waiting for evaluation? And and as a follow, sorry, as a second follow up to that, should you mention that these I IEP evaluations occur annually? If that does not happen and there's an issue mid-year, let's say, or near the end of a school year. Um, again, anecdotally, I've I've heard that the process begins again the following school year. So just speaking to the fact that this is a lengthy process and these students have needs that need to be addressed in real time, if you could speak to that, please. Absolutely. So uh, two questions. Um, so I'll start um, 
with the waiting for placement aspect of this. So home and hospital, um, there are students who um, their met, like I said, their medical need, it comes with a you know, certificate from a provider indicating that they need to access home and hospital. There are times where a referral may have been made already through the IEP team to a private separate day school setting or a regional program placement or placement outside of homeschool for whatever reason. Um, at the same time that that referral is made, there are times um, that students maybe, uh, let's use mental health for an example, that the mental health need is at a place at that time that they really need to get stabilized before accessing any setting. So there are times when home and hospital is used um, as it should be to help support that child um, and get their me get them medically stable, whether that's mental health medically, whether that's um, physically, you know, stable, in order to then access the next school placement. So there are times where I, I like to think of it as in tandem instead of an interim. We don't put on home and hospital in order to wait then for the private separate day school, for example, to to come apart, to come up th that placement to come through. Um, what I, as far as um, your question related to, um, my mind went blank. The second one um, was related really about the, the the annual cycle Thank and like, what if there's a problem mid year, yes. right? That we <laughs> can you. have a team at any time. Absolutely. Sorry, Alex, I don't want to steal your thunder. No, thank you. I thank took you. notes and I missed that one. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so the team can happen at any time. It really is. That's what you think of it. Um, just as that you you want to plan, you're going to put it in place, you're going to monitor progress. And if that student is not showing progress, then we need to come back to team. That's also required through IDEA. So at that time, there are you know students that we may make a non-public referral for early in the year because it's clear that their needs necessitate that. I will also say that there are students that come through the child find process who could have needs significant enough that we may make a referral to non-public as their initial IEP. It is not common by any means, but it is absolutely can be something that occurs because we are required to provide the services um, and the least restrictive environment and placement that best is able to implement the, the IEP itself. So um, that really as much as we hear that it's a lengthy process. Um, and what I will say to that is, we also are required to support their students in their least restrictive setting, and that's really important. So we're required to put in those supports and services to adjust how we're providing those supports, to look at their goals and objectives, to make sure their supplementary aids in, are in place in order for them to access that the, the least intense setting that is appropriate to meet their needs, right? Um, so there are times as that goes through as we might start an LREA and then we realize, you know what, they're not making progress or they have this level of need and we need to put some other supports and have some time outside of gen ed and then they may end up in LREB, then they may end up in a, a regional program and even at the regional program, we again monitor, see how things are going and then there might be a recommendation for non-public, but it doesn't always have to go in that progression, there might be times you have a student in LREA whose needs really require a different level of service and the IEP then drives maybe a, a referral to private separate day at that time. Thank you for that clarification. And I'll share that um, the frustrations I hear are from our faculty, our, our teachers, particularly across um, academic years, across those school years, because they have shared that the process starts from step one again every time there's a new school year with the evaluation. So just passing along the feedback, but thank you very much for answering those questions. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks thank for being you. here. Of course, thanks for asking the question. I appreciate it. So just to getting back to this team referral, this really just talks through how how it gets to the non-public schools themselves. So I said that the team develops the IP, we determine the LRE, the referral is made to that private separate day. And as I was indicating, there are private separate day schools um, non-public schools for a variety of needs. So, and they specialize in different areas. So just because it's a non-public school doesn't mean they meet the needs of all students. So we make those referral based on the IEP and the unique needs of the student. Students and families are then interviewed and accepted or declined at the non-public school. Um, and, and another thing to kind of highlight here is that they are private facilities. So we don't have control over whether or not a non-public school accepts a student. So there are times that we might get a family who is frustrated that they may have been declined to a school 
for example. Um, and, and that is really something that's outside of our control. We make a referral and then it is at that school's discretion on whether or not they feel like they can best meet the needs. Also, whether or not they have space at that time. Um, our non-public schools deal with some of the same kind of things that we do as a school system with staffing needs and other other things that sometimes make that referral process also um, take a bit of time. Um, and then student receive services at that NAMA public school with case management and oversight by Baltimore County Public School staff. So within the Department of Special Education, we have case managers who are special educators who support with the IEP team process in the non-public schools. They um, oversee the service delivery. They go in. We are actually required to monitor service delivery in our non-public schools, so they also do that. Um, but that is that IEP team referral process. So next slide, please. So the other way in which a student may get to a non-public school is um, as part of a dispute resolution process. So as you know, there are you know a lot of factors that might weigh in with regards to um, the needs of our students, and, and they can be complex. So there are times when, um, as part of the resolution of circumstances, a student may end up with a referral to a non-public school for um, maybe a period of time as a resolution. So it might be that um, a parent or they have, you know, so we'll go through like a unilateral placement. So a parent makes a decision to place their child in a non-public school outside of the team process. They then notify Baltimore County. We hold a team. Sometimes um, there, there may be the best decision working with both our, our legal office and our compliance team work collaboratively on this. And the decision may be to agree to service that student in that location and that private separate day for maybe a one year period and then for us to hold a team process and have them return. There are other times that as part of that resolution, it may be that you know what, there is documented lack of progress for a, a, a good amount of time, students weren't making progress or a failure to provide FAPE. There are things that happen that we are then required to resolve those situations through um, one of which may be a recommendation for a non-public. So um, there are times also that as intensity and frequency of students needs that the school team and the department special ed work together and a parent may feel that a student is not making progress. The school team may feel that they are, um, but it may get to this a place at times where the best decision is, you know what, we need to move forward and that student may need to access a non-public at that time. Attorney and advocates initiate requests sometimes, um, again, resolving ongoing parental concerns or complaints, and then MSDE complaints at times. So our families have the avenue um, to make a complaint to Maryland State Department of Ed regarding service delivery or what could be um, issues with regards to the provision of FAPE, that free and appropriate public education for their child. Um, and a part of those complaints as they, you know, are investigated, we we investigate internally, MSD investigates, and sometimes an outcome may be that there's a recommendation for either a change in placement or a recommendation for the team to have to come together and then have a conversation about what what makes sense to meet that student's needs. So while it is outside of the team process on some ways, it always comes back to that IEP team, which I do want to highlight. So regardless of any of these measures, it does come back to that IEP team then writing the IEP that may reflect non-public, coming back and monitoring it, ensuring at the same time, just like as we do in public schools, that we continue to, in non-public, is really look for that progress. So if a student is not making progress in non-public, it may be that sometimes access to peers is something that's helpful for them. So it might be that we need to actually look at a public option again and, and to go to a less restrictive setting. So it's obviously you know, a complex process, which no case is the same, <laughs> but um, that this is just another avenue of how we land with um, in, into non-public. And next slide, please. So this is an overview, um, the historical cost aspect of non-public placement over the last five years, um, which you can see here as far as the progression of spending there. Um, it is one of our largest budgets, we do realize that. Um, as far as our current enrollment in non-public, this is just some data points here. We currently have a 638 students approximately. Um, that was our October count number, so um, that was 638. Um, the average tuition cost is that $83,800. So um, kind of to go with the question earlier, we do have students that access a residential setting that are through that IEP team process. So we're funding both um, you know, school and residence. So those, the cost of those um, placements 
can be in the um, hundreds of thousands of dollars for those cases. We also then have a school that might be um, in let's like, say a $45,000 range. So when we talk about that average, it's just kind of where you get there as far as with the, the variety of costs for services for students. The next part of the slide here talks about um, the 300% figure, which is in Baltimore County, it's $31,000, $31,238 you can see here, and that's the base amount of funding that Baltimore County pays for any student placed in non-public school. That rate does shift year to year, but it's generally about approximately around that amount. The, the breakdown there on the example is to really kind of um, explain how um, the funding works for non-public students. So if you take just as an example of a tuition of $100,000, we initially pay that base amount for every student. So Baltimore County pays that $31,000 amount right there. That excess cost is where it lands with the $68,000. Um, the state share, the state then pays 70% of that excess cost. So you can see that would be about 48. Baltimore County pays 30% of the excess cost. Um, and then the total cost for Baltimore County is that 300%, that base figure of the 31 plus 30% of that excess cost, which results in us paying approximately $51,000. So that $100,000 mark is usually an easy way of being able to depict there <laughs> um, how it breaks down um, because that 300% figure can be a bit, bit complicated as far as um, how, how our students are funded. And that is the end of my presentation. So if there's other questions or anything, please let me know. Happy to answer any questions. All right, committee members, are there any questions? I have one, Mr. Kuhn. Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, when you say excess cost, and thank you, this is very helpful. This, this is clear. Are we talking above and beyond the costs per pupil in general? We're talking excess for the non-public placement, correct? Above so and beyond the state share, state and local me. share. So the way I'm describing excess cost is when we're looking at the total tuition for a student after the excess cost is the amount that is split between the state and Baltimore County after we pay that base figure, which is that 300% figure. So as kind of depicted is that that total tuition amount for every student on public, we immediately pay out that 30, approximately 31,000. Then the remainder of that is split 70-30 amongst the jurisdiction and, and the state. So the 30% that is left for us is added to that base amount, which then results in the total cost. So the excess cost des description is really the excess leftover tuition after we pay our base amount, kind of your down payment. <laughs> right. If, is this but would the students still be counted towards the base allocation BCPS receives from the state? Ms. Ms. Hen, um, I'll jump in. Um, Thank you. Yeah, this is this is the expense side. OK, right. We receive funding for our students based upon a formula and actually uh, Mr. Tantliff will probably be going through a little bit of that detail in the next part of the 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 presentation the, the the blueprint so that's the that's the that's the revenue side so for these students once they we've gone through the process uh, that was described and this this student ends up in a non-public placement and in this case that non-public placement costs us one hundred thousand dollars this is the formula for how we pay for that one hundred thousand dollars it's a it's a hundred thousand dollars for that student to be in that placement the uh, the first thirty one thousand two thirty eight always comes from us, meaning BCPS pays okay. that thirty one thousand, and then right. as, then the state starts to to kick in, and that's where you know. So the more expensive the placement is, the more the state kicks in. The lower the lower impact placements are more on us, but this is just a formula for. Um, how we pay for it. So there's kind of two different things. Thanks. Yes, this is just the expense si side of it. OK, thank you. So it doesn't impact the revenue side in terms of well, how I, this student would be counted or I'll, I'll hold that question until yeah. we get to it. No, that's actually a good question because I probably missed a, a key part there is so you have your regular uh, 
foundation funding that, that Mr. Tantliff is right. going to talk about. And then this other uh, um, state share that that was was the 48,133.40, that is an additional line item uh, based on specific students. So that is so so for this particular student, this $100,000, 51,866 would come out of our normal operating budget. Right. And then the 48,133.40 would be additional revenue that we would receive from the state for that student over and above our formula funding. Did That's I say that right, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, there's a you'll see on the next slide when we get into it, there, there's actually a line item for the state's share. So we would foot the full bill and then get reimbursed via the revenue, just as Mr. Hartlove just said. Right. So if we wanted to look at the net, it's over and above this the normal state funding. So it would be yep. less that if you take that away from the yeah, I'm with you. Thank you. Yep. That answered my question. Thanks. Ms. Causey, you had a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation and um, your um, commentary. I just wanted to try and understand um, in terms of uh, overall for providing for our students. Are we in? Um, a trend of um, more expeditious referrals and less um, MSDE complaints. Um, how how are the metrics, or what are the metrics that would um, advise the board and advise a superintendent as to um, where improvements need to be made, or in general where where improvements you know are being shown. Yeah, so I think that's a complex question. I'll say that. So um, we work through, there's a lot of professional learning that's um, supporting schools around compliance. And that's one aspect. That was where IEP chairs were really critical to that. Those IEP facilitators um, that were going to are really critical to some of that work because we've identified over time that um, our students um, there, we do have a good amount of students that end up in non-public for reasons outside of just that IEP team looking at progress and making that determination that they need something more restrictive. Um, you know, whether that is lack of progress or um, or or um, a compliance error that occurs that is enough that makes us may have a recommendation to settle the case, things such as that. We are monitored by MSDE and there are metrics in place through MSDE that show our progress as a system in the areas of special education and that um, obviously is public that we are in a place of needing to make improvements um, with regards to our special education services within Baltimore County um, and we are doing um, you know a lot of things to address that through professional learning through really did a great IEP development um, training this year for all special educators to participate in and making sure that we have really good solid IEPs in place to because that ultimately drives um, services and progress for our kids. Um, again, that IEP facilitator is going to be a huge aspect of that, just making sure that um, our teams are, are compliant, but also really responsive to the needs of our students. Um, we have professional learning for principals and for administrators and for teachers um, just ongoing to make sure that um, special education students are supported. They're general education students first, right? So making sure that we're all on board with being able to provide that level of support that our students need in our system. So I, you know, I guess in summary, there's a lot of different measures, I would say, um, kind of outlining how services are delivered and, and how we're doing for meeting the needs of kids. I think we have some really complex kids in our system that non-public truly is, the, is you know, the best way to meet their needs. There also is a subgroup of kids sitting in a non-public that I think we could also support in public schools. Um, and we can work to, you know, continue to improve in order to be able to have those kids access um, public school or step back down to their to their public to their public school. I hope that answers your question. If I if I may just add um, to this, and I, I don't want to belabor the point, I just want to um, offer for our board members 
uh, we know that one of our major strategies to address um, improving our service to our students that have uh, um, individual service plans is really the IEP uh, facilitator at the elementary level. And Ms. Causey, I know you're very uh, connected and involved um, in your leadership with CCAC, and that's something that CCAC has advocated for for I think close to 10 years. We were very excited to be able to use um, ESSER funds this year to put in place uh, the elementary IEP facilitators. We've had to roll that back a little bit just because we, you know, staffing challenges this year. But we're very excited that over the, this year and into next year, using those grant funds to help us for, uh, create the evidence base of how important that is because that's a strategic infrastructure to help us with many, many aspects, not just um, students that um, are may in the long run need a non-public placement. But I just want to, to share that that's really a very critical strategy for us as a organization to provide greater service to our students. Um, and we're very excited about that. And we're hopeful that at the end of the ESSER um, resource that we're able to then help step that one to the operating budget because um, it's it's just a major lever. So thank you for the opportunity to add to that. And the other last thing I would say, um, and certainly as as Allison was explaining, you know, certain students, depending upon the severity of their needs, a non-public setting may be um, the best place for a period of time. Um, part of our LRE, of course, is to, while a student may never um, uh, not have their disability, our end game is really to help our students learn uh, strategies so that they can mitigate whatever challenge they may have, right? Um, and so that's why when she talks about students maybe stepping down from a more restrictive environment to a less restrictive environment, because the goal is ultimately to prepare our students with strategies, methods, and techniques that they then become more independent and are able to move forward uh, with greater levels of independence in a general environment. So I just offer that, and we know every student's um, challenge is is different and and for some maybe they can do that and for others maybe not but i just offer that as part of of this whole process so thank you thank you for that and and, and um i really appreciate um that additional comments because we know that for our students um the earlier we can address their needs yeah. the better off they will be um in the long run and and that's the same for our um, general ed students in terms of reading proficiency if we can get them on level then it's easier all the way through it's they're more successful with less um less needed uh the other thing i wanted to ask about quickly is with uh the iep um with the student information systems uh, are those being utilized or how are they being utilized so that teachers especially when a student is in a gen ed or partial gen ed situation that they understand you know pretty quickly what a student needs yeah so as part of the iep team process um, we are required to have what's called a snapshot of skills for the for a general educator so the i so the special educator has that comprehensive iep they're required to share with all providers for the student what those start a, a snapshot of what those students needs are so that's their goals and objectives that's their supplementary aids um and they are able they're also required to review that every time the iep is updated or a behavior plan is updated they're required to review that with all providers in order to ensure that those services are delivered across settings as you're describing. Um, so they can have access to the student information system around it, or what we call SPS for special education. They can have access, but really um, I would say the more comprehensive way is through that snapshot in order to really allow for that conversation, which is what we want between providers around, being, um, around provision of services. OK, thank you. And then mm -hmm. if there's substitute teachers, how is information given to them to understand um, if a student has an IEP or a 504 and then what you know accommodations or what behaviors you just might be looking out for? 
Yep. So similarly to what I just described, those things should be available to our substitutes as well. So in a lot of buildings, I'll describe as a building principal, I had um, substitute folders for each of my classes. So within that, there were the snapshots for my students, right? So that whenever we had a sub or any any other person that would come in, they would have the information they needed in order to best meet the needs of kids. So that really is best practice. And, and that is something that we you know share with special educators and administrators as far as what should be happening. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see the question from um, Ms. Hen. Yes, Can I Mr. Kuhn, did you want to see if four other committee members had questions? First. Um, I'm mindful of the time. Yeah, we're running over on this topic and I still have some questions, so I'm going to move on with my questions. This one is going to take us down a rabbit hole. Um, maybe we can send it via email to share. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to uh, continue to answer questions through through that method. All right, so uh, just so we're clear, we are talking about LREG here, private separate day school, when we're talking about the budget aspect that we're discussing. Is that correct? Yes. We're not talking about funding for the public separate day schools. Those are those are separate line items, correct, Mr. Tantliff? That's just in our regular budget, yes, under special education. Okay, thanks. I just I just wanted to really quickly clarify that. Um, uh, the three hundred percent number. What is the basis of this three hundred percent number? It's it's defined by MSDE. So that's a number that they have provided us. Yes, that's the state formula that every district uses. All right, thank you. Right. So to focus again on the actual budget piece of this, because um, I know we could sit here and talk about non-public probably. I have lots of questions about it, but I'm I I you know I I just want to focus on the dollars here. Um, uh, the the amount that we have showing right with like uh, 50 let's say the 55 million dollars for FY22 that is that the amount that um, um, BCPS or you know the board is funding in total with the state monies that that reimburses or is that just part of the total? That'll be the total expense that we pay for those students, which is the full cost of the students. The offset from the state comes in on revenue, which we plan that way. So in other words, because we're getting 30 million more in state revenue, that's that much um, you know, less expense we or that much more expense we can absorb. So we see the full expense, their offset is an increased revenue. Fantastic, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to fully understand where we are. Um, and how do we how do we come up with base the, the number? How do we come up with you know fifty four million next year? It looks like it's going down a little bit. I'm just curious as to how we understand the fluctuation because our, our class changes every year, right? Um, let me take that out. So um, we're basically, because it's so big, uh, we're looking at how much did we spend this year? How much are we projecting to spend? And then if we expect inflation and tuition, because there's so many pieces here, there's children moving in and out of non-pub all the time. Our numbers change every month. Kids come out. I believe some would go back in. They all have different needs and different costs. Um, as Myers was showing you how wide a range there is uh, for the children in non-pub. Um, we're really doing it at a very macro level, but then her team does the projection during the year at a very micro level. So they're trying to look at each child's 
tuition and how much they're spending. Um, and it's quite a, a chore, but we do it at a high level. And because these expenses have been increasing and more kids have been going into non-pub, to some extent, we've been chasing our tail and we've increased the budget by not quite as much as our actuals have been going up. All right, and a, and a quick question um, regarding the 638 students. Uh, I understand IEPs basically you know, we were talking about how they kind of reset and, and they have to be done every year. But if we have children, um, students in these programs, we must be cognizant that they're going to need to stay in the program the following year. Is there a way to, to create continuity um, for students and their families to where saying, OK, you're you know, you qualified for this last year, you're going to qualify for this this year. And then we move on. Or, or is there this this elaborate team activity that occurs out of pocket every year to determine that that's still the case, um, and and they can stay in the placement they're in? So we are required by um, that IEP team process is part of IDEA and Comar. So we are required to go through that process of determining, um, you know, how how is a student progressing? We gather progress every quarterly progress reports on students' IEPs to determine if the goals or objectives need to be updated. And then you come back to the table to review progress and then determine what that LRE is for the student. Um, for a lot of our students in non-public, non-public really is their LRE. That is where they should be. That's what it is. And um, although I will say our case managers do a very nice job of developing relationships with families, relationships with schools to make that process as efficient as possible while still, you know, meeting our um, mandate to review and monitor and make sure that, you know, our non-publics are meeting the needs of our kids. We also don't want to um, leave a student in a, in, a, in a site of service or a school where we know they're not meeting needs, meeting how, that's not meeting their needs. So we would also be negligent in doing that. So that team process is really critical to that. But I can assure you that, you know, we can we work to make sure it as um, as seamless and efficient for families as possible, because I do agree that there's a lot of anxiety around if you are feeling like every year this might kind of, you know, we've heard that. Is it going to get uprooted? And if it really is their LRE and they're making progress in that setting, then that is that is, you know, most times what that team would recommend. I will say that for some students, we talk about that slide that talks through other ways they get there, whether that's through, you know, a settlement agreement or um, services out, you know, other the, the MSC complaint, different things. For those kids, a lot of times we feel, Baltimore County feels that we are able to meet their needs um, and, and we are able to meet their needs, but unfortunately there were circumstances that whether, you know, the free appropriate public education wasn't provided or the student wasn't making progress appropriately, that if we were able to put things in place for them, um, we may be able to bring them back into public school and they can make appropriate progress there. So those those cases, um, we also are required again to make sure that we're best meeting the needs of students and their least restrictive environment. So we're required to say, you know what, they don't need a private separate day. They can access the same level of need. Their their IEP needs, their goals and objectives can be met in, you know, their home school or in a regional program with Baltimore County or whatever else. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your time. We're going to move on now to um, to our next item, item 2.2, .2, Blueprint Revenue Projections. Um, Mr. Tantliff, could you please review uh, these projections and provide some insight to the committee? Sure. Right, uh, so the spreadsheet I uh, brought up was in board docs for today. Um, I have a couple other notes off to the side. Um, so what uh, Mr. Kuhn wanted to talk about today is, <clears throat> is blueprint in terms of how the revenue might look over the next few years. So we're uh, not going to go into uh, what does it mean programmatically because that's really, really complex and we could never uh, touch on that today. Um, and, but Melissa, uh, Dr. Wistead is here today. She may be able to answer questions if we get into that area. And also um, is the debut of Miss Lisa Murphy, who's the a senior analyst on my team, and she does a lot of work on Blueprint. So uh, if we get bogged down on something technical, she may be able to uh, jump in and help. 
So what we really wanted to do today is this is not an official projection, but based on some assumptions, this is what uh, the blueprint revenue might look like over the next few years in terms of growth. Uh, we can tediously read the legislation um, and and do a lot of the components very accurately, but there's some things we're just not going to know, and we have to make some assumptions. And uh, you know, for instance, our relative wealth to every county that drives a lot of the formulas, um, a portion of it. So we can just trend that, uh, but that may uh, throw our calculations off to the good or the bad when they finally come in. But this is probably as good a crack. Uh, as anyone's going to take at it. So uh, really, we're just going to give you a little taste today because there's uh, really quite a bit to it. So uh, I'll just kind of go into it. Uh, feel free to stop me along the way for questions. So just taking a step back, and I think everyone here is familiar with it, but we used to have state funding called the Bridge to Excellence or Thornton Formula which uh, officially was still in effect through FY22. The blueprint legislation, which was vetoed and then overridden, has started to phase in over the last few years. And FY23, uh, the funding formula is now officially called blueprint. So there's no official, there's no uh, blueprint and um, Thornton or Bridge to Excellence. It's all now the blueprint formula. And so all pretty much all of the old revenue streams have remained, but were enhanced. There are some new revenue streams that were added. Um, some of them are very, very prescriptive on how we spend the money. The most prescriptive being concentration of poverty. And if you remember a few months ago, uh, Ms. Stansberry, along with Dr. Boswell McComas, uh, came or and uh, Dr. Wisted, and we talked about Title I and concentration of poverty. Um, so it it really is very prescriptive, and they tell us what schools it goes in. Some of the other uh, grants are going to be more directive than they have in the past, but but as a state, all the LEAs are trying to fully understand what that means now. So that's just kind of at a high level. So if you see here, the first line is foundation. That's always been the core per pupil funding from the state um, since uh, Thornton. And you can see 22 actuals, the 23 budget, and then you can see our projections over the next few years. Now, uh, the interesting thing in the legislation, whereas there used to be inflation factors within the legislation, what they did for the 10-year projection um, the first 10 years is they defined how much foundation would be and every other grant is a percentage of foundation. So that's kind of uh, what they did. So interestingly, the amount of expense and revenue that uh, we are projected to grow by is probably <clears throat> less than people uh, would have thought originally because they weren't thinking inflation was going to be seven or eight percent. So that would have driven up the old formula. So in other words, when they said how much it's going to cost, like I think three billion was the number. Here's what they projected bridge tax zones would be. Here's where blueprint was. But bridge tax zones now would have been more like this because that had an inflation factor in it. Neither here nor there, just kind of interesting conversation. So uh, what we put over here is this is defined in the legislation. Can you see where I have per pupil allocation 8642? So, um, and by the way, we're talking about just state right now. Blueprint also gives directives for how some of the county money uh, may be spent as well as the state money. And, and that's all what I, I've been talking about. There's been many meetings going on to really understand what that means in the future. So for today, uh, we're not talking uh, about any of that. We're just gonna try to understand the formulas. So you can see the per pupil, I uh, see it goes from 86, 42, goes up 87, 92, 
and 97. These are all defined in the legislation. Now, the one thing interesting is, I don't know why, but FY25, the formula ramp up uh, is very modest. And so you'll see when we get down to the bottom line, our projected growth for 25 on state revenue is, is relatively small. I, I don't know if there was a rhyme or a reason why they did it like that, but FY25 is sort of off trend in the blueprint legislation. So in any case, uh, this number gets multiplied by our, all our eligible students, um, as do all the factors I'm gonna show you here, but there's different numbers of eligible students that are included in each line item. So, but this is the key thing because everything in the legislation is based on how much the foundation per pupil amount is. You can see these were some uh, COVID one-time initiatives. That's why they're zero in 23, but they were pretty big in 22. Um, those were kind of one-offs. GCEI uh, exists this year for the last time. That's the, just the regional cost difference. That actually gets replaced by the comparable wage increase. So this is just a remnant of the old formula and it gets replaced next year. So you can see that gets zeroed out in the future too. Um, so our next uh, component, which we haven't seen yet, is the comparable wage uh, index. Mr. Yes, Mr. go Kenneth, ahead. Sure. Can I, can I ask a quick question? Yes. The um, there's actually two questions I'm going to ask real quick. The declining enrollment hold harmless line item of twenty six million dollars. That's a significant amount of money, right? Yes. Um, and 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 then in the out years like twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, we're adding a thousand students a year, and that's just an estimate or a guesstimate, right? To try and it was just know, to demonstrate it. what yeah. would happen. Yes, right. So. The the actual enrollment, there hasn't been any change, right? Meaning if it isn't 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 growing or hasn't gotten back to pre-pandemic numbers, are we going to actually see a decrease in our budget because of that? The per uh, with lower uh, student we, count? Uh sure. Well, you'll see on the bottom, the answer is no, because the formulas got significantly enhanced this year. Uh, and so that will overcome any drop in enrollment. Um, so the the stuff like the declining enrollment that those were one time fixes in the legislation. And uh, what what gets used now is a three year rolling average, excluding 2020, which was the year you know right at the height of the pandemic when enrollment fell way off. Um, if you recall, though, we unfortunately stayed flat to 2020 in September of 21, and we don't have our official numbers yet uh, for 22, but the growth is likely to, to uh, not be that significant. So the, the growth we have is less than it would have been otherwise. We use a three-year rolling average of enrollment. Um, so once we get to about next year, we'll have gotten through our higher numbers so right now, if you think about it, we're using net for next year, we'll use September 22, 21. We'll skip 20 and use September 2019 as year one. September 2019 was a very high number. That was 115,000 before uh, we started dropping off. So that year will drop. And then in FY25, it'll be 21, two and three, in other words. So then we'll start even if our growth is very modest, we'll start our base will have have leveled out by then. All right, thank you. I don't want to take us too sure. far off topic. I know we're trying to focus on the changes associated with, you know, the new with the yeah. blueprint. Um, and you know, so. they could they could find that around the state enrollment um, growth didn't pick up this year, and they may pass a one-time fix in the legislation that enhances, you know, some sort of declining enrollment. Um, they might not, though, because, like I said, everyone is most I think everyone is going to see growth in their revenue this year because of the enhancements to the formula. Thank you. Um, OK, so comparable. Pardon me, Mr. Kuhn, may I ask a quick question before we move on? Go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. 
Um, Mr. Tantlove, so the, the focus, the board's focus, and I think everyone's focus has been on the changes, as Mr. Kuhn said, that Blueprint is bringing forth um, through the legislation and the subsequent increases in funding to support the initiatives, um, the programs, the everything that's new. So I think one thing that hasn't been discussed as much and you just brought to my attention is the fact that it sounds like the funding formulas across the board, including everything we're doing currently, are changing. Is that a correct statement and that we should be expecting changes to our baseline allocations for what we're we're seeing today? And well, starting in FY23, the blueprint legislation was fully in effect. So the legislation defines every bit of state revenue we get. It's not an add-on anymore, which is what it had been as it was phasing in and went through the veto and then was approved but not fully implemented. So in other words, last year, we were still under bridge to excellence with some enhancements. Now we're fully under blueprint, but most of blueprint takes the existing grants, if you want to call it that, in our general fund under Thornton and enhances those formulas and adds some additional form grants to on top of that. Are there stipulations that could result in schools seeing noticeably different allocations to school funding? Well, I mean, school funding is mostly teachers. That's what 95% of the money when we say school funding is. So as we as we get more revenue, as we increase teacher salaries, which um, have to be $60,000 at a minimum by July 1st, uh, 2026, per uh, school funding is going to go up pretty significantly based on that. Then on top of that, uh, concentration of poverty for the schools impacted it's a tremendous amount of money. It'll be more than Title I uh, pretty soon. So those schools will be receiving all of that. So however you want to measure it, when and, and actually there is a lot of, there is enhanced reporting required of Blueprint to be in effect. We're stabbling in it now, but it's supposed to be in effect by FY25. Um, we haven't seen what the reporting will look like, but we believe we'll need to report at the school level, similar uh, to the ESSA reporting, different formula, but same concept. Um, if you remember last year, um, Pat Fannin and uh, his uh, one of his managers, Greg, came on and we went through the ESSA formula, and I know you've seen that in other forums, but that get, that's taking all the dollars, and it's mostly an allocation formula, where they can't directly put it in the school and they report how much money each school's getting, there's probably something similar we'll be going to by FY25. Okay, and then are we basing, specifically going back to concentration of poverty, basing our projections on which measure of poverty, considering the board's looking at expanding CEP potentially to other schools? And I know this came up in, I believe, two meetings ago. Are we looking at, or will that impact? The the state our defines the use the school. state. Oh, sorry, Ms. Hen. No, please continue. Uh, the state tells us which schools are COP based on a three-year uh, measurement of poverty. So, um, just for perspective, we and there's two components of it now, but the base component COP. There was 22 schools last year, 38 schools this year. And then we're expecting 72 schools next year. Now we don't know the number for sure yet um, because we don't have our final poverty numbers for our schools and they use a three year average and sometimes it doesn't exactly equal uh, what we have, but order of magnitude, it's gonna be something like that. And then there's an add on called the COP per pupil and that's going from three to seven to 32, same schools, but, in, but even additional funding for those schools. How is that money supposed to be um, spent? 
Well, it's directed towards a community school sort of model where um, uh, maybe Dr. Wisted wants to, she spent quite a bit of time uh, on this exact question. So why don't I defer to her on that? Sure, thanks, um, Wit. So there, every school has to do a needs assessment and the funding, it's very strict. Um, as to what you're allowed to spend the funding on. So it's different than Title I, where um, so much of the allocation could be spent on specifically school-based needs. This is uh, specific to the community needs. So they have to do a needs assessment and they have to do things within the community with the funding. What does that mean within the community? I don't understand that. So when I think of a school, I think of I think of delivery of education via teachers, specialists, what have you. Is that is that what you're talking about, or is there stuff outside of that? Correct. It that would not be those funding? things. It would it's not beyond be those that. The, the spirit of it, uh, Mr. Kuhn, is really recognizing that students that are impoverished. They're, they not only need all those things you just talked about inside the schoolhouse during the school day, but that the community itself needs support. So it may be uh, supports around health services. It may be supports around food and nutrition, right? Like if a student is, is impoverished and they live in a community where there's a food desert, they need access to all those things beyond the, the hours of the school day. So that's sort of the, the big picture. Um, Dr. Wistow, if you want to expand on that. Right, so um, unlike the examples you were giving, right? So you can't um, pay for a, an additional teacher or a reading specialist or things that schools traditionally would use Title I funds for. You could still use your Title I funds for those kinds of things. You do a community needs assessment. So as an example, four of our schools, the four original schools that started are combining and overlapping their funds to um, build the uh, mobile unit, right? So they're going to have a vehicle that will drive through the neighborhood and there'll be different things on the vehicle on certain days, right? There could be um, medical supports, uh, you know, kids could get vaccinated or something like that as an example. And, you know, ride through the community and all three communities and get those things. It could have tutoring services and that could be for the adults in the community or the children in the community. It could, uh, one of our schools is working on um, getting legal uh, supports for families that might need it for different reasons. So they do a needs assessment at the school and it is um, not specific to students in classrooms. It's community needs. So I did some quick math. And we're talking about $380,000 per school <clears throat> for 72 schools with the $27.9 million for 24 and beyond. So you're you're saying that every penny of the $380,000 per school, and you said they could be pulled among schools, so I'm not quite sure how, how you structure or manage that. Um, who actually determines how that money is spent? So it's not an exact amount and not every school doesn't get the same amount, right? They, they get different um, amounts again, based on the per pupil. Um, th there's sure, a, I was just throwing a number out to just right, throw it right. out. So the group decides there is a team of people, right? There's a, a work group, a community work group, um, and they do the needs assessment and that what determines what the money is spent on. Ooh are those people? Are they the principals? Are they community members? Are they it, a combination? Correct, combination of people. Um, not just they, not just the principal, like how operating dollars are spent and Title I dollars are spent. Even the Title I dollars, they're supposed to have a group, but it's usually a school-based group. This must include community members as well. And who selects these people? I'm just trying to get to who are they? How are they accountable? And and what is it that they have to? What what do they have to achieve with a significant amount of money in their community? Um. So 
as far as who selects who's on um, the committee, uh, the the school, every school has a, a community uh, facilitator, um, community schools facilitator, it, it, and uh, that person's hired by the principal. Um, and so they really take the lead on collecting who is going to be in the group. They do outreach to the community to try to solicit people um, in. They do a needs assessment if uh, people cannot be on the committee and they attempt to solicit input from additional members in the community that maybe aren't on the group to um, determine what the needs are. All right, thank you. Uh, I know I'm taking this off a tangent. Oh, so some ahead. of the dollars like the community schools coordinator, extra medical, there definitely is a big chunk of the money spent within the school too. But it's, you know, part of it's that outreach you just described, like that community schools coordinator went to each school. So that was initially how we got up and running. Thank you. Is there anything else or should I go on? I'll, I'll let you go on. All right. Well, OK, so. So the can you talk way, about the transition? Can you talk about the transitional supplemental instruction? Because it sounds uh, like yeah, Dr. We'll McComas down, we'll would definitely like to talk about that. Um, OK, you want me to pop down to that? So uh, one one thing I'll say uh, for concentration of poverty and TSI, those have been around for a few years. And this year we have them in special revenue uh, because until this year, uh, they acted totally like a grant and had carryover. Uh, we will likely move this back into the general fund next year. That's just uh, an FYI. But TSI um, is, for the most part, reading specialists and math specialists, mostly reading. And it's through third grade and it's for struggling learners. Um, so those are not defined by MSDE. So uh, Megan Shea and her team uh, go through and figure out where the best placement for those teachers are. And there's a lot of crossover, I think, with Title I in some of the Title I uh, schools and positions uh, that might have in the past been Title I uh, have fallen onto the TSI grant. But you can see that actually phases out by FY27 and goes to zero. Uh, and concentration of poverty, we're showing it flat, but it could change, you know, based on the lineup of our schools. But again, this is sort of uh, you can only get so granular in the out years. Um, so if we go back up here, so the everything he like I said, so for instance, comparable wage is the foundation program times 6.5% times this phase in percent, which is 49 percent, 49 percent, 47, 46, all defined in the legislation. That's how we get the amount. Compensatory ed, uh, which historically is based on your farm count. Um, it, it still is. It's just more money. So it was started uh, in FY24 at 87 percent of foundation, then it goes to 86, 85, um, and 80. But you can see the dollars are still going up because foundation is increasing for each of those years. So the percent goes down, uh, that goes up. Um, limited, Angli limited English proficiency. Um, it's been a smaller uh, amount of money in the past. You can see that starts at 100%, so 8642, same as the 8642 up here. Then it goes to 102%, 98, 94. Uh, but you can see that number is going up pretty significantly. And then uh, special ed, which starts at 7951, you can see it goes up pretty significantly because it goes from 92 to 99. That's a much higher jump than any of the other grants then to 103 and 112. So the amount uh, per pupil for special ed uh, is going up pretty rapidly. Um, then 
Uh, these are old grants that are really just sticking around. Transportation for special ed, that wasn't changed in blueprint. Print transportation is just, there's a formula based on the number of children who take buses. That part of the formula is not changing. So that's why it's not, you know, as a like percent of foundation. We talked about COP. We talked about TSI. Pre-K. So um, pre-K is uh, very interesting and gets getting a lot of focus and conversation. But um, I, I think the board members here know in the past, the and this is still true, the base formula for Blueprint is based on K through 12 kids. But now pre-K children who are uh, right now below 180% of poverty going up to 300% of poverty in a full day program only will um, start being eligible for funding, which uh, we, we've we received already. Now, uh, this is an anomaly. See this 17 million here? I don't want to get bogged down on this. That's a lot of money. When this, that's just for this year. What happened in, in summary is when the state was issuing the money for pre-K, instead of using just full day programs, they used all the students, including half day, which for BCPS, we're a primarily half day program system right now. So we got 15 million extra dollars last year. So this all came up kind of when the county was finalizing the budget. The state knew about it. We sent them a bunch of emails on it, as did other districts. Um, and they said, well, we're just going to leave it there this year and then we'll correct the formula next year. So essentially you got a one time um, kiss of money that's going to go away. Now, over time, it'll start building back up to that, but we can only slowly add full day pre-K. We open a new elementary, we can do full day pre-K. We can convert some half two half days to a full day where appropriate. There's some buildings where we can squeeze another classroom in uh, for pre-K children. So uh, we're planning on slowly growing that each year, um, but we are obviously constrained by capital and physical, physically. But you can see we, we are projecting to get 4.7 million next year, and then it'll keep growing as we grow pre-K, but if we figure out a way to convert classrooms more quickly, uh, this money, it's one year in arrears because this year's enrollment drives next year's revenue. But if we can crack that nut and speed it up, um, it'll essentially pay for itself. So just so I'm clear, um, are we talking about BCPS providing pre-K services and private pre-K services in the county? Um, we provide our traditional pre-K, but as part of Blueprint, we have to pass through, and, and I don't think we're sure on the process yet, but there was an, uh, a very strict eligibility requirement for private pre-K providers, uh, and we, uh, the state essentially is going to start paying tuition for those kids. It's kind of income based and it'll transition over time, but they put a chunk of money. Or, or I'll say this part of the pre-K formula that we get is to pass through the private provider tuition. Did you want so to add anything part to of, that? Is Melissa? that part of this money? Yes. OK. Thank so that'd be that's, just a pass through. That's not a kind of an on top of, and there'll be offsetting expense. We don't know exactly how it's going to work mechanically yet. Did you I, want anything Dr. Wiss said to that? No, nope, got nope, it. Nope, okay. I was just going to share how, yes, we are um, required to honor any family that meets that up to 300% poverty at a private um, provider that meets the credentialing and all of the things that the state's requiring. Right. And I, I mean, our major limiting factor, two two limiting factors, right? Space in buildings and teachers to manage pre-K, right? We need both 
and probably lots of other things. I'm, I may be simplifying it, but literally we're bursting at the seams in our current schools. So I'm curious as to how they expect us to grow pre-K. And then my last, I'm sorry, are pre-K students, do they, do they count towards our overall overall projection, projected enrollment? Um, they don't, they are not part of the core blueprint funding. But now, as we are saying, if they hit the poverty level and they're in full day, they now generate revenue, which they didn't before. No pre-K students before blueprint generated any revenue. So if you're like the city and almost every child is in a full day classroom, they're getting lots of money from this uh, grant, tens of millions of dollars, because and almost all their children will hit the poverty threshold. So I don't know off the top of my head the number, but it's big. Well, and also I want to note that it's three year olds and four year olds. So, you know, so it could be two years. Of pre correct, correct. Uh, to respond to the facilities um, question or comment um, that you made about how do they expect us, um, you know, Baltimore County is unique um, as far as the other uh, local education agencies, the other districts are already providing full day programs for four year olds um, who meet this criteria and are working, you know, on the three year old um group so we we are unique in our space constraints that's part of uh, mr can i'll just add the spirit of that idea of the um local daycare providers is that they recognize every school system is positioned differently in terms of their available facility space um, and to your point staffing um, as well, and so I think they uh, this the attempt was made in the legislation to provide a wide berth, if you will, for school systems to kind of work through what their unique posture is and what resources are available in the community. Um, but again, those community resources have to meet the state criteria, uh, which is pretty stringent uh, from from everything I've looked at. So it's either way, it's it's going to take time to get us there. Yeah, I mean, even there's parts of it that we're not meeting yet, uh, but we still have a few more years before we are required to. So one of those, as an example, you talked about staff. So obviously all our teachers are certified. That part's easy. The assistant who's in the classroom, the requirement in Blueprint is that they hold an associate's degree or what they call a CDA, a child development associate's degree and right now um, the staff member in our classrooms are, we call them a pre-k assistant uh, the requirement right now is for them to have a high school diploma so that's just another layer um, i do want to share something positive uh, you know i was sharing how you know, we're kind of unique in baltimore county in this pre-k situation but where we are excelling is in the ccr uh, section right so the money that we received for college and career readiness, um, you know, we expanded, you may recall, um, and we're going to have pay for an AP exam, one for each student this year. We expanded the CCBC opportunities and, and you know, the, the college opportunities and we're expanding youth apprenticeships. So we already had dollars in our operating budget. And so this extra money that came in, um, you know, we were able to do those things and other LEAs are really struggling um, to open up access uh, because they were still charging families for um, college classes as an example. Um, and so, you know, I just want to share that, that we're, we're doing well in some other places than other LEAs. Unfortunately, the, the facilities um, for early childhood is where you know we need to work to or, or expand our private providers and ensure that we have more of them for our kids thank Thanks. you and i know we only have uh five minutes left so i'll just try to bring it on home so a couple things i want to mention is the four things in blue here concentration tsi 
pre-K and career and college readiness, which Dr. Uh, Wistad just mentioned. Um, these are highly restricted, and so we have this money segmented almost like a grant. And as I mentioned, two of them are in special revenue, which will but they'll probably all be in the general fund because it'll make reporting much easier once it all goes into effect. Um, but the, the big thing to take away from that is whereas concentration of poverty is going from 12 million to 28 million, we can't think of any of that being usable for the general fund for salaries or anything else because it's highly restricted in its use, as Dr. Wistead was mentioning, is going to go to specific schools for specific purposes. So one thing about Blueprint that doesn't get talked as much is there's a lot of mandates along with the revenue. The revenue projections um, based on what Department of Legislative Services put together when the legislation came about is, you know, gone off the rails because of the pandemic. They've never updated enrollment. And the state as a whole had pretty strong, not every LEA, but we had pretty strong enrollment growth. Well, without that enrollment growth, a lot of the revenue doesn't come, but there's a lot of mandates with those increases in revenue. So it's, you know, not all a walk in the park. Um, there's something called a transition a grant which phases out in 2030. It's pretty small. Out of county, non-public, and aging schools um, are all existing grants. They're not part of blueprints. A national certification is becoming part of this new career ladder. Um, national board certification starting this year is $10,000. And it's $17,000 if you work at a low performing school. So I think this year uh, there were 60 some odd teachers eligible for it at the beginning of the year. Uh, you can expect with an enhancement this large that we're gonna probably get a very significant increase over the next several years because it's gonna be so worth people's while to go through the NBC process, which I understand is fairly laborious. For 2000, it might not be worth your time. For 10 to 17, it certainly might be. Um, and so here in the bottom, uh, and again, these will get firmed up once we know enrollment for this year, once we know wealth and get uh, further information. But of this 41 million, as I mentioned, 16 million of it's from concentration of poverty. So it's our really, our usable money from the state is only going up by 25 million this year. Part of that, uh, is because uh, we got the, all that extra pre-K money last year that, quite honestly, the county took um, advantage of to give us what we were asking for, but um, that also was money they didn't have to put in because it came, it, that got finalized after the board uh, did the budget. But the long and short of it is we really only have about 25 million to work with this year. I mentioned 20, 20, FY25 has a fall off. The formula doesn't really get enhanced for whatever reason. It's a quirk in the legislation. And then in 26 and 27, you can see uh, we start getting pretty strong uh, growth on the state revenue of about 5% uh, percent a year. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. I think you had some questions, Mr. Kuhn. In the uh, Ms. Hen. Um is asking, she says she had a quick question and we're going to hold you to it since we have it three minutes quick. until we're ending this meeting. It's just um, hopefully some easy homework. And Mr. Taylor, if you may already have this, um, you mentioned that there is also impact on the county revenue share. And I was wondering if the board could receive, um, this is a great spreadsheet, by the way, um, if we could receive a one row update that would indicate the county impact so that we could see that as well would be uh, well, very helpful if you have that information. Well, well, I'd say this in terms of top line, county revenue is just going up along with maintenance of effort because the state considered the county to be in an overfunding situation when Blueprint came into being. So basically, um, maintenance of effort works like it did in the past. Uh, although we use a three-year average of enrollment because that's uh, more beneficial to us. Uh, but in other words, it's going to be our number of children last year. How much did they get per student from the county? 
that amount uh -huh. per student times this year's enrollment. So that won't change. Um, what could change is how the money gets directed. That's what Blueprint talks about. So the top line doesn't change, but how we spend it may change somewhat. So all of these these items then are subject to MOE then for the county share? Well, you know, the county MOE is independent of any of this. The amount of money they pay in has a completely separate formula based on what these they spent the year before. The state blueprint legislation is an independent uh, funding mechanism that talks about county funding. Um, and for some counties, it will force additional funding because they were not in an overfunding situation. But right. uh, it just directs how the money should be spent in the future, which may be somewhat different than we spend it now. But that's that's the part that we're all working on and trying to sort through. So it won't change the top line for, as far as MOE is concerned? Yes, that's correct. For the county? OK. Correct. It, my original question remains, if if we could see that on here, it would be really helpful if if that's not too difficult to provide. I would ask Mr. Kuhn to request that on behalf of the committee if no one objects. Bam, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Magically. Told you to be quick. Can't. Thank you. Sure. The quote of the evening. All right. Well, look, I appreciate everyone's time. It is now 7 p.m. and this meeting is ending. The next budget committee meeting will be November 16th. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you all. Take care. Take care. Have a good evening. Bye.